You know, after spending over two years in the Old Testament, it kind of feels weird to have three sermons in one day from the New Testament. We touched this morning, dealt with the exclusivity of the gospel. That's crucial, <coughs> critical. I remember when I was a student at Jefferson Community College down in Louisville, there was a Presbyterian church, PCUSA obviously, that I would pass, they had on their sign, celebrating God's wildly exclude. No. That would have been correct. Celebrating God's wildly inclusive love. Back in the 90s, I was early 20s. I was trying to figure out what exactly that meant. God's wildly inclusive love. What, what, what's that even supposed to mean? But as I've come to zero in on the exclusivity of the gospel, they're making a very bold statement in celebrating God's wildly inclusive love. And it shows how far a denomination that was once a powerhouse for the gospel has fallen. And it should serve as a warning for us. Because if they can fall, and they were at one time a gospel-centered denomination. Anybody can fall. Just because we have elders now that are keeping us close to the tenets of Scripture, what's going to be the case a generation from now? We must always hold to not just a verbal mental assent of our confession, but we must always know what it says and know why it says what it says. For example, when we were talking about the church and worship should be done in a language that's understood. Well, when the folks who wrote the Westminster in 1689 wrote that, what were they talking about? It would be easy for us in 2022 to point the finger and say Pentecostals and Charismatics is who this is directed at. It could be an application. But in 1689 and first chapter of Westminster, it wasn't Pentecostals and Charismatics that they were making a very bold statement when they said worship should be done in language that's understood. They were differentiating themselves from the Catholics. Because even in this country, up until 1960, help me out. It was in the 1960s. 67, somewhere around that. Catholics didn't do worship in a language that was understood. The passage we're looking at tonight is the clear, expressive, loved description of salvation. Today we look at the first of five formerly now contrasts. Let me write that out because just saying it doesn't quite catch it. Formerly now. Paul makes in his letter to the Ephesians. Showing the difference between a life of sin and life in Christ. Formerly, you were in a life of sin. Now, you have life in Christ. The present text offers foundational theological principles on which this letter, all of Paul's letters, the New Testament and Scripture is built. We see in these ten verses, the former life of sin, we see mercy in Christ, 
we see salvation by grace. As I pointed out this morning, chapter verses is a relatively modern convenience. It makes it easy for us to be able to look up something. Imagine how hard it would be to look up a particular passage of Scripture to work numbers there. Well, in the original, these first, the first seven verses would have constituted one sentence. And if you look at the King James, some of the modern translations you can put a period after each verse. If you look at the King James, you've got semicolon after verse 1, colon after verse 2, period after verse 3. Well, that's where the King James gets it wrong because the first seven verses is one continuous sentence in Greek. We'll just read the full ten verses. And you, happy quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein the time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh, and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace you're saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places. In Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved in faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, unto good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk in the Lord Jesus. Speak to your word. Use your word by your spirit to speak to your people. In your name we pray. Amen. When you look at the Paul's letter to the Ephesians in particular, it's important to notice the pronouns. One pronoun that you'll see if you read the King James, is the word ye. If you read it in one of the newer translations, it just simply says you. Well, the problem is, in modern English, what does you mean? You could be either singular or it could be plural, correct? But if you look at the King James, the King James actually has separate words for singular and plural. If you look at the King James, you also see the word thou. Thou is thou. Ye is ye. Thou is singular, ye is plural. Paul's not writing this letter to an individual. <laughs> Salvation, though you and I must come to him individually in confession and repentance, salvation is not a you and Jesus by yourselves, you and your Bible by yourselves. You and me were called, as the confession rightly says, to community. When, when God said it is not good that man should be alone, specifically in the context of Genesis, he was referring to man being single, creating Eve as a helpmate suitable for him. But if you look at the entirety of Scripture, and particularly the, the community of Israel, congregation of Israel, and the New Testament churches, you can also see it's not good that man be alone. These folks who, well, I can worship God while I'm out squirrel hunting, or I can worship God while I'm out fishing, or I can worship God 
and commune with God while I'm out golfing. Yeah, you can have communion with God, but it's not true worship. You can have personal worship, but you need the ye that's corporate worship. Sometimes, different pronouns indicate different groups. It's clear that in some cases of Ephesians, when we see ye, that Paul is speak speaking specifically to Gentiles. There are other times when, G when Paul says we, Paul was what? Jewish, that he's speaking, speaking specifically to the Jews within the congregation. There are other times within this letter that it's not quite clear whether the pronoun is speaking specifically to this group or specifically to this group. Guess how you determine that? What's the three, three rules of real estate? Guess what the three rules of hermeneutics are? Context, context, context. Or as my hermeneutics professor used to say, context is king. Context is just another way of saying location. So in real estate, if, if we get to the point where it's time to grow and it's time to build or to purchase, best location would be right out here on the U.S. 421. Right in the middle of everybody coming and going in themselves. Not out toward correct and my mind is what uh, what? Greg's good, yeah. That was just, all I was thinking was honey job. And I knew that, that wasn't the, the area. Rexville, correct, but right here in the center, the population center for sales, right on the, on the main strip where people are coming and going, where people can see location is critical in real estate. Location is critical in our news. What do we see about the former life here in verse 1? And you had he quickened who were dead in trespassing and sins. Guess what? Dead men don't do. Dead men don't walk. Dead men don't talk. Dead men don't move. Dead men don't cry out. The General Baptist would have us think that this was somebody that was wounded that was in critical condition that might be in ICU but the scripture says you were dead in trespasses and sins. There's no walking, there's no talking, there's no moving. This is specifically talking about Referring to soteriology, the doctrine of salvation, but we also see packaged in this eschatology, last things. We see a realized eschatology. We see that the end invades, the end permeates the present. So in eschatology, we, we so often think, well, things to come. Jesus is going to return. Bad things are going to happen. There's going to be tribulation. The kingdom's going to come. But it's, it's not that linear. The end reaches back, invades, permeates the present. When Jesus was incarnated, 
Jesus is the end of the law. He is the end of the prophets. When He died, He died for the sins of His people from Adam to the very last person who He, he will ever elect. When He died on the cross, his blood reached all the way back to Adam and reached all the way back to the last person he will ever choose for himself. Death controls life. Somebody once said when little man was born, commented, said, you won't make it out of life, uh, you won't make it out of this life alive. Is absolutely true. From the moment you breathe that first breath of air outside of the womb, you begin the dying process. For some, it takes longer than others. Some will reach that centenarian status. Some won't make it out of childhood. And there will be many in between. Man has no relation to God and is powerless to change. He is pulled to destruction. This one who is dead in trespasses and sins has no relation to God. He is powerless to change. And he's being pulled toward destruction. You think pull toward death and hell. And it's only by God's grace that He is redeemed, that He is salvaged, that He is saved. Verses 2 and 3. Where in time past, ye. So He's looking at these folks and saying, you walked according to the course of this world. If Paul were here amongst us and we didn't have to read this, but he was speaking this message to you and me today as Sovereign Grace Assembly, he would look at all four of us, all five of us, and he'd say, you were in time past were walking according to the course of this world. According to the prince of the power of the air, who is who? Satan. The serpent. The spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. Who are the children of disobedience? Who are the children of disobedience? Specifically, as Paul's thinking about. Specifically, as Jesus dealt with it in his ministry. Jesus looked at the religious leaders and he said, You lie because you learned it from your daddy, the devil. Those Jews who rejected their Messiah are who Paul has in mind here that are work that the spirit of the prince of the power of the air is working in them as the children of disobedience. By the way, because I believe that most, if not all, of the New Testament was written within 40 years or less of the resurrection and ascension. Paul's writing this while the temple is still standing. He's writing this before Jerusalem is, is destroyed. He's writing this before the Jews are dispersed over, over the globe. They are the ones who are the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in time past, in the lust of our flesh. So if he's, if he's looking at the Jews and saying, you walked in this way, then he broadens it and looks not only at the Jews in the congregation, if he's 
And he's speaking specifically to the Gentiles in the beginning, saying, you walk according to the course of this world. And he broadens it to include the Jews and himself. He's saying, in time past, we also walk according to the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the lust of the flesh, and in the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as others. A good Jew might want to hear this. A good Jew was a child of Abraham, a child of promise, a child of the covenant. And he's saying, we're by nature children of wrath as others. You Jews were children of wrath, even as others. What, what did we look at this morning? The Jews need the gospel. All people need the gospel. Why? Because all people are children of wrath. The Jews, as others, are children of wrath. That sinful nature and wrath translates
pages of Paul's writings. How many times within the pages of the New Testament do we see those words, but God? God. The us. Who is rich in mercy? For his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sin, hath quickened us together with Christ. That by grace you're saved, by, uh, by grace you're saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Mercy and love are the revelation of God himself. When Adam felt God being holy and just would have been within his rights to just annihilate The very, the, the, the very notion of Adam defying God, rebelling against God, reaching forth for that fruit, should have resulted in annihilation. But God, who is rich in mercy. But God, who is rich in mercy, gave instruction to Moses to write the Pentateuch. Gave instruction to Moses to write Job. Gave instruction to the prophets to write. Gave instruction to Matthew and John as apostles of our Lord to write. Gave instructions to Mark and Luke as associates of the apostles to write. Gave instructions to Paul, to Paul to pen 13 letters revealing himself. Mercy and love are the revelation of God's And we have that revelation for us, preserved word by word, line by line. Precept upon precept, chapter, verse, book, writing. Genesis to Revelation. Paul says, raised with Christ, raised and seated, provide commentary for made alive. You were dead, but he made you alive. You were dead, but he raised you with Christ. Just as Jesus was resurrected that Thursday, so you were risen from your death in sin to life in Christ. In your seed. That's eschatological right there. Raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Paul is reaching into the present, pulling from the present into, or reaching forward into the future, pulling from the future into the present, saying, You are seated with Christ in heavenly places. Salvation requires being joined by grace to the Savior. Romans 7. Romans 7, verses 4 through 6. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ that ye should be married to one another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sins, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit in the death. But now we are delivered from the, from the law, that being dead wherein we were held 
that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. In the ages to come, verse 7. What are those ages to come? Some would surmise that Paul's looking way out in the distant future. Perhaps even a time after you and me. But as you've heard me say before, there are two ages on this earth. There's creation. To the cross. And there's the cross. consummation. Creation of the cross and cross to consummation. The old Jewish age begins here at creation and ends right here 70 AD. The new Christian age begins here at the cross ends here, and there's this overlap between the cross and 70 AD, in which the Jewish age and the Christian age are operating side by side, parallel to one another. And so Paul is living in the same kind of age that you and me live in, because he's a believer in Christ, he's been saved by grace through faith, he's trusting Christ's finished work on the cross. But that Jewish age has not yet ended. Jerusalem has not yet been destroyed. And Paul is looking to this, ultimately to this as well. But he's looking to this right here when we as believers are ruling this world. Proclaiming the gospel. Salvation by grace. Verse 8. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, and not of works. And not of yourselves. Let me start over again. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. Faith, faith, pistios. Romans 1.17. Romans 1.17. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. What is from faith to faith? From faith is justification. To faith is glorification. And it includes everything in between. From the moment you first believed and to the moment you breathe your first in glory. And everything in between, which is your sanctification. From faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Galatians chapter 3 verse 11. But that no man is justified by law and son of God. It is evident the just shall live by faith. Of course we won't take time to turn there. But in both the Romans text and the Galatians text where is Paul pulling from? Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4. The just shall live by faith. The dispensationalist who would say that back here in, in the days of Moses, the law of the prophets was the dispensation of law, and in Christ we have the dispensation of grace, misinterprets and is blind to the simple reading of Scripture. How would 
Habakkuk. Be able to look at his contemporary audience and say the just will live by faith if that dispensation has to live by law. It's never been about the law. The law was a tool, a schoolmaster, a tutor to lead us to Christ. But the law was never intended to be saved. The Jews in the Old Testament were not saved by the law. The law pointed them to the promises of God. Verse 9, not of works, lest any man should boast. Not of works, lest any man should boast. A lot of contemporary Christians, even folks who are not Calvinistic, will readily admit that salvation is by grace through faith alone. But they stop at justification. Justification is by grace through faith alone to contemporary non-Calvinistic, non-particular Baptist, non-reformed Baptist, non-reformed folks. But if we understand Scripture, Philippians, chapter 1, verse 6, what does Scripture say? Being confident of this very thing, that He which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. What do we know about salvation, past, present, future? What we know, know about salvation, justification, salvation in sanctification, sanctification in glorification. It's not just that you are justified by grace through faith alone, but he who began a good work in you will complete it. The non calvinists will oftentimes agree with us that yeah, we're saved by grace through faith alone. I didn't do anything to get saved. But then they defy Scripture and say, but I'm the one that keeps me saved. Isn't that dangerous? If you're the one that keeps you saved, you're in big trouble. If you're the one that keeps you saved, you have no hope. Because if you can keep yourself saved, you can get yourself unsaved. And that is scary. Not only that, but the General Baptist, the Arminians, twist Hebrews 6. When they point to that, to that man who was once in life, once tasted the heavenly fruit, and then walked away. How many times have I heard our many and said, well, so and so got saved. Well, wait a minute. He, 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 he got saved back there, but he lost it. Now he got it back. But Hebrews 6, that you readily cite for some, to say somebody's able to lose their salvation, says what? It's impossible for him to get it back. If you're going to be consistent with Hebrews 6, then you got to say, well, if he lost it, he's doomed and he's damned. There's no room for boasting either in justification or in sanctification. It's all of God from start to finish. It's cutesy, it's trite, but it's a good way of remembering it. If your faith fizzles before the finish, it was faulty from the first. I don't read of Jesus saying, well, God put you in my hand, and I put you in the Father's hand, and you're able to, to wiggle out 
somewhere between a knuckle. I put the Father put you in my hand, I put you in the Father's hand, and no one can snatch you out. Guess what? You're someone. If no one can snatch you out, then that no one can snatch you out is you. You cannot snatch you out. God's new creation. We are His workmanship. Just as God spoke everything into existence, and then on the sixth day, down down to the dust, and formed man of dust of the earth, breathed into man. What other creature did God breathe into? What other creature did God get His hands dirty with? Everything else He spoke into existence, but man. He formed man of the dust of the earth. He breathed into man. And in the same way, in God's new creation, God did what? He condescended. He came to us in the incarnation to form a new creation in Him. If Paul left off verse 9, we could say we have no responsibility. But when you look at verse 8, 9, and 10 together, you see God's sovereignty and man's responsibility working side by side. God's sovereignty does not negate your responsibility, and your responsibility does not diminish God's sovereignty. In fact, man's responsibility is a much more theologically accurate way of saying what the free will Baptists say in saying free will. Because we don't have free will. We have since Adam. We don't gain free will back in salvation. What we have in salvation is responsibility. Responsibility that's sovereignly given to you and me. In Christ Jesus. What does it say about those good works? Created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. You believe God is one, you do well. The devils, the demons, also believe in truth. What's man's responsibility? Faith without works is dead. You say you have faith but have no works? I show you my faith by my works, James says. Man's responsibility shows God's sovereignty. God's sovereignty gives man responsibility. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we bow before you. We thank you that you brought us from death to life. In your name we pray. Amen.